Hi everyone and thanks for joining us. My name is Jamie Bezaidenot and today we are joined by Lauren Fogelman, a business coach and founder of Business Success Solutions. Um, thanks very much for joining us today, Lauren. Oh, absolutely, Jamie. I'm looking forward to the conversation today. It should be really good. Lauren is a keynote speaker and one of America's top ranked business coaches. She's been recognized by HubSpot in its annual list of the world's top 22 business coaches. So a really prestigious award there. Uh, she delivers talks and workshops across the United States at major conferences such as Inbound, one of the world's most esteemed content marketing events for entrepreneurs, as well as niche accounting conferences. Lauren is an expert in pricing strategy and sales for accounting professionals. She coaches them to shift away from a dollars per hour pricing trap to a more value-based pricing model. And this allows her clients to reduce workload by as much as 50% while doubling their revenues. So really, really interesting. Um, why did you kick us off, Lauren, by just giving us a bit of background and telling us uh, how you got into uh, value-based pricing? Uh, actually, I'm a sports psychologist turned oh. business coach, and what I realized is that my education gave me all the tools to do what I do really, really well, but it also prepared me to be an employee working for someone else instead of a business owner, and because of that, I realized that there were three gaps that I needed to fill in order to have a business that I run instead of one that runs me, and the first one was how to communicate value. The second one was how to be able to price my services when I didn't want to connect my fees to time. And the third one is how do you enroll new clients when you don't really like the sales part, you don't want to push or pressure anybody mm. into working with you. And I found that firm owners could benefit from those uh, strategies as well. So that led me in the direction of what I'm doing right now. That's pretty fantastic, uh, and I think not at all what you expected to be doing uh, when you started your professional journey, but it's, it's uh, very interesting how um, our journeys and professional careers kind of change over time, and you see a, a nice gap in the market for yourself. Um, so, you know, um, a lot of accounting professionals and consultants love the idea of time-based billing because it's empirical and it's objective and it's measurable. Um, and I think there has been a, quite a shift in the industry um, in the past few years to value-based pricing, which is more um, holistic and looking at the amount of effort you're putting into the work or the consultation um, as opposed to just how much time you're spending um, on it. So there are some, um, uh, you know, commentators in the industry that might be skeptical about how realistic uh, value-based pricing uh, might be and what say you to, to those skeptics, Lauren? I, I think the first thing is that accounting professionals in general, they love formulas. And if you have the equation of knowing what your hourly rate is, then measuring how much time you spend working on a particular client's file, and then multiplying that to come up with your rate, it is a nice, clean, easy formula. But in reality, it is so messy because you also have to track time, you have to invoice, you have to follow up on late payments, and it isn't quite as simple as it sounds, plus you end up leaving money on the table. Mm. So if we like formulas, let's just flip the equation. The traditional formula is starting with your time, your operational costs, coming up with the price, considering the client, and then the value to the client. Now, if we are looking at it from a value-based perspective of pricing your services, we actually take all those variables and we flip it. So we're looking at value to the client, considering the client's needs and where they're at, coming up with your price, then looking at your course and your time. So it's all the same variables, but we're just flipping the equation, which means that it's a little bit of a mindset mm. shift to be able to approach it differently because of the fact that you're kind of reversing the order instead of what you traditionally had done up until now. Absolutely, and I think what you said, uh, you know, with regards to a mindset adjustment is quite key to that. You are always going to, I think, get uh, those that are more resistant to changing their mindset. So it can be a tricky task. Um, my, my next question would probably be, how can businesses effectively communicate their value um, or, or the value of their services when preparing to raise their rates? That is a tricky question because 
What we fall back on is coming up with a way to justify. Oh, we have increased operational costs, the economy, and we're passing our increased operational costs on to you. Mm. Well, no, no client wants that to happen. That feels like punishment. Yeah. And what you want to do is approach the conversation in a client-centered way. Don't just tell them that you're raising rates because of your increased operational costs. What you want to do is benefit the specific things that you're doing for your clients that they care about. So once again, we're flipping that equation. We're yeah. prioritizing the clients and their values. Tell them how you many hours you save them in time from not having to do it themselves or manage someone in-house doing it. Maybe how you've been able to reduce their tax liabilities or been able to improve their cash flow and decision making and possibly even add in some concrete examples. Like when we had that one meeting and I gave you that tax tip, you ended up saving ten thousand dollars this year on yeah. taxes that wouldn't have happened otherwise. So that's what you want to do is lead with what is a priority to the mm. client instead of your time and course, which are priorities to you. Absolutely. I think uh, return on investment is a very important consideration for everyone, regardless of which industry you are operating in. So um, really important to demonstrate, you know, it might have taken me an hour, but it probably would have taken you five or 10 hours to achieve the same outcome. Um, so really important to, to demonstrate the, the value of, of your time as well and how much you're actually saving the client. But as you said, understanding what is important to your client or to your customer. Um, from mm -hmm. experience, we often find ourselves in a situation where, especially in the beginning stages when you are trying to generate um, some rapport, you've got a new business relationship, or you understand that this customer or client might be important for future um, business strategies or, or future unlocking future customers for your business, we do often find ourselves in a situation where we would rather provide the service or the consultation um, at a cheaper or a, uh, a free rate to help please a specific client. And what would your response um, or advice be uh, to consultants or anyone in the industry um, who might be thinking on, on, of doing this? Um, and would you, would you consider this to be damaging to the value that they would be generating for those clients? Well, the first thing is I understand the impulse because you're client centered, you know, you can make a difference and help that person. And that is what is encouraging you to go ahead and discount. But I want to say that if you go ahead and discount your fees with a client, then it teaches them that your fees are suggestions as opposed to firm. And they will always ask for a discount from that point forward. The other thing is there's a difference between discount and negotiation. A discount is just lowering a price, but everything as far as the service remains the same, which actually will lower perceived value from the client's point of view. A negotiation is a give and take on both sides. If they want maybe to be able to have a lower fee, then go ahead and adjust the services you're doing and maybe take some things out to be able to meet them at where their budgets are. So that's something to consider. But the other part is so much of this has to do once again with mindset. Mm. And that if you're meeting with someone and they ask for a lower fee, some things to consider is maybe you were in the conversation and you told them what your fees were and there was silence. Mm. And that dead silence got you very, very anxious. You offered a discount before they even asked yeah. one to break the silence and reduce your own internal tension. That's something to think about. Another thing to look at is some clients are what I call poker players. Mm -hmm. They have a role where they always ask for a discount no matter yeah. what, even though they were ready to pay your full fee. Absolutely. Uh, but they believe that if I don't ask, I don't get it. So you have to realize that some of those people are going to be willing to pay your fee. Mm -hmm full fee, they just are poker players. And the other thing is when you're moving over to value pricing, you offer package options. That's because people need to have comparisons when making decisions. And I would rather you offer them three package options so that they can decide which way to move forward with you is a best fit as opposed to whether to move forward with you or move on to another option. So those are some things to think about is this is definitely about internal discomfort that causes you to give a discount, but there are some strategies you can put in place so that you don't end up doing that. 
I love the bit um, where you mentioned, Lauren, that uh, your, your rate should never be negotiable. Um, you know, if you, if you are more flexible with them when you are having those discussions with clients, um, they can kind of get away with anything in the future, right? So it is really important that if you've got a rate, that you stick to that rate. And sure, not be too rigid and have those negotiations uh, where you can um, have a bit of flexibility, but it is really important um, that you do stick to your pricing um, because, yeah, it's fair at the end of the day if you've, if you've made the choice to, to charge a certain rate per hour or per um, output or whatever the case may be there. Um, and I really liked uh, the part that uh, where you mentioned, you know, almost playing chicken with the client. You've given your, your price for your service and there's that uh, awkwardness, uh, that silence for a little bit while you wait for them to either accept or come back with a counter proposal. So yeah, definitely been in a few of those conversations before. <laughs> Just with regards to time. I think that we all have, Jamie. Yeah. Uh, and, and these are some of those expensive wording mistakes that we mm. make on the, on the fly. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can't be too rigid. There has to be a degree of flexibility, but at the same time, you need to stick uh, to your guns and to your pricing. They're there for a reason. You've obviously done the homework and you know how much things cost in your mm -hmm. business. So it is important that you stick to your guns in, in those specific instances. Just with regards to uh, timing and strategy, Lauren, uh, you know, I think it's, it's quite a difficult uh, um, decision to make. When is the right time to consider raising rates um, in your consultancy or in your accounting practice or in your business? Um, and are there any specific indicators that you should be looking out for either within your own uh, business or within um, the broader macro environment? Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, there's no one size fits all mm. for that's across the board uniform because some firms are at capacity and don't really want new clients. Other firms are still growing and have the room to bring in new clients. If that's something to consider is where you are as far as your capacity with your firm's evolution and growth. But some things to consider as far as indicators are maybe you wonder if you're charging enough. Or you've been thinking about raising your rates for quite a while mm. and you haven't done it yet. If that's going through your head, then it's definitely a clue that it's time to go ahead and make that change. It could be that you've been using um, time-based pricing, whether it's a flat fee or an hourly rate, and you've dabbled with value pricing, didn't quite understand it, didn't quite work, and you went back to the tried and true formula that you knew but you'd like to really make that change because you're tired of tracking, invoicing, and following up with collections. Mm. So if that's something that's going on, then you want to go ahead and consider making that change with a proven method. Uh, and if you have too many price-sensitive clients, then we ought to consider looking at that as well. But one of the things that I feel is that when it comes to how you price your services, if you're pricing based on an hourly rate, you need to realize that coming up with the concept of charging for time happened over a hundred years ago before there was technology and that charging an hourly rate doesn't have the ability to compensate for technology or your gained expertise over time where you become more efficient just because you're better at what you do when you first started out. So we need to realize that when you charge for your time, it sets you up as someone who does the compliance work, a technician, and it actually undervalues your expertise. Mm -hmm. So that's part of why we want to move away from the time-based fees over to value pricing is because I want you to be seen as an expert, a consultant, an advisor, as opposed to a technician. Because when you're a technician, you're seen as a commodity, mm. you'll always have to compete on price and there will be always someone else who's willing to race you to the bottom yeah. of the pricing threshold. Absolutely. I think that's a, a really important point to make. Um, the, the pricing war to the bottom is extremely dangerous. If, if you are operating in a um, sea of different accounting practices um, and you're just based on or focusing on, on, on cost as the key determinant to who's going to be doing your books on a monthly basis, um, yeah, that might not be the best strategy right because it speaks you, you to the quality what, Jamie, there's actually one other thing that came up that i wanted to yes. mention also and this happens so often is that a lot of firm owners they'll go ahead and raise their rates with new clients coming in but those legacy clients that have been with them forever stay at a older grandfathered in mm. price and if that's going on in your firm then it's time to be able to 
effectively get your legacy clients up to your new mm. rates as well. Absolutely. And it probably should be something gradually rather than all at once, right? So what would your recommendation be um, with regards to, to shifting to a value-based pricing method? Mm -hmm. uh, there's actually a formula that I use with all my clients. And this is the five steps to think about is that you want to let your clients know that you're making some changes to your business model. We don't want to justify about price and operational costs that have been increased. We want to make it client centered because the majority of firm owners that I know are very, very client centered. Mm. So this isn't aligned with how they approach their client work anyway. Then what you want to do is calendar time to meet with your clients, especially the ones that you have a closer relationship with or that might be getting a more significant price increase. When you meet with them, you want to have what I call a value conversation where you're focusing on their priorities, understanding what are their needs, their wants, and their desires. Their needs are the essentials that are required to be operational and profitable. Their wants are things that they would like to have in place, but either don't have the capacity to do it or the knowledge to do it themselves. And their desires are future focused. And, and I see that actually as the sweet spot. If you look into ad and advisory services, it's understanding some milestone or future goal that they want to achieve and then educating them about how you can help them achieve that maybe even better, faster and exceeding their expectations if you were able to continue teaming up with them. So you want to have that value conversation focusing on their priorities instead of just justifying about your additional time and cost. Once you do that, you want to discuss the three package options that you uh, can offer them. I call them silver, gold, and diamond. And the silver is usually very basic with just the requirements for being able to follow their taxes and the compliance side. The gold has some additional insights so that these business owners are making better decisions moving forward. And the diamond would be more of outsourced CFO level mm -hmm. services. Because we're talking about current clients, prepare for some objections because some clients will want to know why you're doing this. They're going to want to know what's different. How come you're raising their fees? And instead of shutting down the conversation that time because you're flustered and it feels like pushback, I want you to be able to be prepared for that and know how to confidently navigate that part of the conversation also. So those are the five steps is informing them with a client centered email or regular letter that you're making some changes, calendaring time to meet with them, having that value conversation, offering three package options, mm -hmm. and then preparing for some objections in order to work through that with them and help them make the best decision for their business. I think that's a really good strategy, Lauren. Um, you don't want the client to feel that uh, they're being held hostage for your services. And, you know, just because you've made a change or decided to make a change to uh, the way in which they're going to be billed going forward, um, that they're kind of stuck with, either, well, I just suck it up and accept the new rates and the, the pricing model, or I need to now look for another service provider. So re I really like what you said, um, you know, scheduling, calendar, uh, you know, putting in the calendar some time to sit with those clients. Um, and when you do so, you can display to them that you understand what their business is and what their desires are, because that just shows uh, that you've got some really useful insights and some knowledge into where they would like to be in the next five, 10 years, um, and that you're a trusted I think advisor. The other part of it, Jamie, that you're bringing up is that it shows that you're not a transactional yeah. type of relationship. You're, you're really caring about them and what's top of mind with them and, and helping them to move forward with what they consider priorities as opposed to putting your priorities first. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so really important that you, you, you speak to your clients on a face-to-face -face basis. Um, and I mean, you would have generated some rapport and some relationship with these clients um, over a, a, a quite a few years, um, imaginably. So it does make it easier to leverage off of that relationship that you have and that rapport that you have generated with those clients to say, hey, let's have a tough discussion um, about the way you're going to be billed going forward. Awesome. Um, so just on the uh, topic of positioning and differentiation, how um, can you reposition your brand or service to help ease the transition to higher rates? 
I, I think that it's really about changing the way that you approach. Once again, let's go back to that uh, equation I mentioned where most websites that I look at for firms, they focus on what they're doing. It's all about them. It's about the tasks. You go to the services page, you see this long laundry list of all the different things you could be doing. And it's talking about the CPA, the accountant, the bookkeeper. But what we want to do is flip the script and go with the equation of value pricing, which prioritizes the client and what they care about. So start talking about them. Mm. Talk about how you're gonna be able to give them insights to make better business decisions, how this is time saving, how you might help them to improve their cash flows or with an expansion that was important to them. Uh, look at more of positioning the expertise you bring and what happens because of the fact you know how to do the work to be able to get their financials strong and healthy. And when you're doing that, then it starts to position you more for that expertise. The other thing that you wanna realize is when you focus too much on the functions or the tasks that you're doing, you're seen as that technician yes. because you're talking about the compliance side. But when you wanna flip the script and reposition, you wanna realize do you want to have a specialty, a niche, or maybe mm. both? And there's a difference between a specialty and a niche. A specialty is what you do for your clients. Maybe it's tax resolution. Maybe it is about advisory services to help them expand their um, business development. So there's a specialty that you offer. A niche is who you serve. Mm. Do you serve a particular vertical? Do you work just in construction or with restaurant or people that have inventory? And it's possible to actually have a specialty and a niche. So you might serve a particular vertical like the restaurant industry and you also help restaurants to reduce fraud risk because they deal with cash and they have a lot of turnover. So that is something to think about is we're changing the conversation. If you tend to have a specialty or a niche or combination of both, it actually uh, raises how you're perceived by people mm. because it leads with your expertise. And it also says that you as well have the technical sides, but we're leading with your expertise first. Absolutely. I think it's really important to understand that uh, or where you operate in the markets and whether you're going to be speciality or niche, um, because you can't be everything to everyone, right? Um, you're bound to upset some people along the way if you aim on being everything to everyone. Yeah, J Jamie, I also want to say that this is something that doesn't happen overnight. Um, and, and I just want to share about my experience. Yes. In the beginning, I worked with a wide range of business owners. And over time, I figured out who I work with best, which tend to be accounting firm owners. And then I was looking for, okay, what differentiates me from everybody else? And it's that I love helping with them price their services because I think that firm owners are unsung heroes. They do so much for their yeah. clients and they don't get adequately compensated, but also they don't like the sales part. So how do you have those conversations when you're extremely client centered? So it was about, it was actually a process and it took about nine years for me to actually go ahead and choose my particular vertical and realize what I do differently and start to make those changes. So this is not something that sometimes happens right off the get go, even though it can for some people, but it's more of an evolution over time of figuring out who you like to work best with and what you can do for them that actually will be a value to the mm. client. Absolutely. I think on the topic of uh, long term and planning for, for the future, um, in terms of long term impact, how can raising rates positively impact a business's long term growth and sustainability, Lauren? Well, I think that what this looks at is that it's a process. And the fact is that if you're able to increase your fees on a regular basis, not just with new clients, but your legacy clients also, it means that you're going to be more profitable. You're going to be working with better clients who aren't as price sensitive. Uh, because you are more profitable, you can reinvest in your own business development or start to build out your team so you can focus on the higher level services or maybe just take back some of your time. But we've talked a lot about 
pricing and the tr tr traditional hourly rate versus um, value pricing. And I'd like to share how to start doing that in order to actually implement immediately as opposed mm. to just this seeming like a good idea. Is that yes. okay if I Absolutely, do that? Absolutely, please. Yeah, no, we would hate for it to just be a pipe dream, right? So let's have some actionable insights here. I, I, I want to give you something that is definitely actionable. So this is what I call the good, better, best pricing model. And what you want to do is have new clients come to you, come up with the original fixed fee you would have charged them for that. And what we want to do now is take that original fixed fee and multiply it by 1.5. That is your new good rate. And I want you to enroll three people at your new good rate. This gives you some insights that clients aren't quite as price sensitive as you thought that they were. After you enroll those three people, we go up to the second tier, which is your new better rate. You'll have people coming to you. Now go ahead and come up with that original fixed fee. Multiply it by 2x. This means now you're now earning double what you were originally charging before, no additional time spent working. Mm. But you're getting better at having that value conversation and focusing on the client's priorities and answering their concerns so that they see the benefits of engaging your services instead of going in another direction. Once you roll three people at your new better rate, we go to the top tier, which is your best rate. I'm gonna say charging three times more takes courage, not confidence. The confidence comes as you get people saying yes. But once again, you're gonna have people coming to you, come up with that original fixed fee you would have charged, now multiply it by 3x. As a result, you're gonna be enrolling clients who are higher quality clients, they are not price sensitive. Mm. They come prepared, engaged, they want to implement the insights that you're giving them. And as a result of that, you don't need as many clients to be able to meet your revenue needs. This means that you can take back some of your time and invest in your own business yes. development, maybe start adding in advisory services, or once again, just taking some time for your own self-care and well-being. So that's the way to be able to start shifting away from time-based fees to value pricing is by going through the good, better, best pricing mm. model. And at some point that best fee is going to need to be recalibrated and you can go through that matrix all over again. Uh, I just want to say if that is something that interests you, you want to go ahead and follow how to raise your rates, you can go to um, businesssuccesssolution.com forward slash raise. I have a free resource that spells it all out for you what we've been talking about. And I just want you to go ahead and start getting paid fees that represent the value that you make for your clients. Awesome. And I think that handout is going to be really um, insightful to all of our listeners um, today. And we will definitely share the link in the bio for this specific um, episode. We don't have very much time left. And I know we could probably um, talk quite a bit longer on the topic. Um, extremely interesting, Lauren. Um, what are some of the cautionary tales, I suppose, maybe just to conclude, um, of practices that have raised their rates uh -huh. either too quickly or without proper planning? I think the first thing to look at is this is where if you have been investing in your clients and the relationship in your client centered firm, know that you can expect between 82 to 100% of your clients to convert over to your new fees. So that's the first thing to consider. But that means that if you haven't invested in your clients and you've been more transactional, then this might not go as smoothly as you hoped that it would. Uh, I also want to say cautionary, only raising rates with new clients and leaving the legacy clients alone means that you are having some clients that are very low profit at this point. A small 5% increase in your rates uh, actually doesn't cover inflation. Mm. So it means that you're still having a course that are going to be below your profit margin. They're going to lower your profits. Don't justify your rate increase with increased operational expenses or the economy. And uh, knowing that this takes courage, not uh, confidence that comes later. So you have to first connect with your value before you can expect anybody else to see the value that you recognize. So those are some of the things to just consider as you're looking at making this transition and increasing your fees. I love that. That's really insightful. Uh, maybe just to close us off, Lauren, what would you like listeners to take away if they took away one thing from today's podcast? What would that be? 
I believe that you're not being given any challenges that you can't rise up to and overcome. And that if you feel you're ready to do this, it will stretch your limits, but you're going to grow as a result of doing this, not in spite of it. And as you do that, you're going to recognize your value more. It's going to be cemented when clients start saying yes, and it raises the bar as far as the quality clients that you engage and the quality of services that you can deliver to your clients. So go ahead, challenge your limits and see the rewards of doing that instead of remaining with the status quo. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Lauren Fogelman, joining us today um, on Beyond Insights. Uh, we hope you took away quite a bit. If you are interested in uh, learning more about Lauren and the work that she's doing, would you mind sharing that uh, website once more with our listeners, Lauren? Yes. If you wanted to be able to um, have a further conversation, you can reach out to me at com forward slash let's talk. And that's the way to let me know that you'd like to have a further conversation about this. Amazing. Thank you so much for your time today, Lauren. Absolutely, Jamie. I appreciate the conversation and what you are doing for the accounting profession. Amazing. Thanks so much. Have a good day further. Cheers, everyone. Keep well until next time.